And we are alive. Are we alive? I'm feeling alive. I'm alive. Yeah, baby. Hey, everybody. Somebody tell me if you can hear me meow. <laughs> All right, can somebody hear me? Okay, thank you, Alan. Guy, Alan, you're a you're a gentleman and a scholar. Just letting me know that I sound okay. Um, first of all, welcome everybody. Uh, the usual tiny group when we get started, and everybody seems to come ten minutes late, but that's all right. Um, my name is Mike Myers, and this is the Monday edition of the Mike Myers live stream. Ask Mike anything here on the Total Seminars channel. The goal of this live stream is to provide those of us who are isolated by the coronavirus mm, an opportunity to eat extra bits of brie that are laying around. To those of us who are isolated by the coronavirus, an opportunity to continue our studies for CompTIA certifications. Now, here at Total Seminars, we concentrate mainly on A+, Net+, and Security+. However, we're certainly capable of going outside of that on an as-needed basis. So all are welcome. All right, so here's how this works. Basically, what you have to do is you send me a question and I answer them. So the best way to send me questions is right here in the live chat. Let me get that popped out so I can see it. So I stay on this uh, live chat screen. It actually has two modes, live chat and top chat. I do live chat, okay? And uh, so all you have to do is type in, <laughs> Maven's already there for me. Well to go, Maven. Uh, so uh, don't uh, worry. Uh, so just type in your questions and I will be there to answer them for you. Jonathan Batman, I've taken the 1001 and passed. Any tips for 1002? Just keep doing what you're doing, John. That's the, the biggest secret to passing uh, CompTIA. Also, I guess the only thing that in 1002, you're gonna see more situation type questions. So I'm assuming you got a good practice test bank and you work with that pre practice test bank and you'll be fine, absolutely. Uh, I know that some of us are more shy type, so if you're the more shy type person, go ahead and send me an email. This is my email address. I'm Michael M at totalsem.com. And so if you've got a complicated one or you don't want anybody to know that you're asking the question or whatever it might be, feel free to email me questions directly. And uh, I will always be glad to answer them there. Also, if you're a gamer, I am Senor Pepe on Steam. And uh, otherwise, I'm Desweds at just about everything. D-E-S-W-E-D-S, -E -E and you can get a hold of me. The secret to understanding Desweds is typing it on a keyboard. So you got your mouse here and your finger here, Desweds. That's all there is to it. So it works out really good for me. And nobody ever seems to claim that one, so we're in good shape. Lots of text coming in. Da -da -da. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna, we'll be okay. Uh, we're gonna just go ahead and set this over to the side for right now. We do have some questions that are coming in from uh, emails and we'll deal with those a little bit today. So anyway, that's how you do. So you ask me questions and I answer them and hopefully we help people continue on their studies and get where they wanna go. So it's two o'clock Central Standard Time here in Houston, Texas. And uh, so we will go till four o'clock or until the questions run out. So sometimes we only, I've had a couple of sessions only took 45 minutes. Yeah, you have a slow day. What are you going to do? Uh, but unfortunately, I cannot go past 4 o'clock Central Standard Time just because I have obligations. Mm. I was eating, literally eating brie and crackers just before I came on. So it's like, ah, I'm a mess. Um, what else? Oh, well, uh, on the interesting side, Houston has snow. That's right, folks. It is, uh, it's about 17 degrees Fahrenheit out there. And it's uh, seven, 17 degrees Fahrenheit. That would be, that would be negative eight degrees centigrade for you uh, folks who like the metric system. And we're cold. <clears throat> Southern Texans should never be allowed to drive in snowy weather. It's like bumper cars out there. There's wrecks everywhere. It's insane. We're going to do the best we can do, but uh, it is a mess. In fact, it's such a mess. Scott Jernigan, who normally helps uh, handle, uh, assist me, has no electricity today. So, well, 
Thankfully, uh, Michael Smyer has happily volunteered. Uh, you'll see him, he'll show up as Total Seminars channel just as me on there. But uh, Michael Smyer is on the job, and I don't know if Dave Rush is around today or not, but uh, they, uh, he, he, he's around somewhere. Uh, also, uh, do keep in mind that uh, it's always helpful. If you like what you're seeing, please uh, like and subscribe to the Total Seminars channel. It helps tremendously. And after listening to YouTube people say that for so long, I find myself saying it now, too. Coffee. It's not just for breakfast anymore. Uh, what else do we have going here? I think those are the big issues. Sorry, I'm reading things here, making sure I'm... I think we're in good shape. All right. Um, so what do we have for... Let's see what we got starting for questions here today. It just feels like a slow day. So not only do we have a freezing situation, I, it, I, I, I literally, I, I wish I could move my camera to show you guys. I got, my palm trees have snow on them. Uh, so it always cracks me up. About every five, six years or so, Houston gets a tiny little bit of snow, but we're, now we're getting, it's the cold. I mean, we usually get a little bit of snow and then it melts in an hour or so, but now it's, we have very cold weather, which is, I brought a lot of plants are now sitting in my living room, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, I got some plumeria. I don't know if you guys know what a plumeria is. It's the Hawaiian Lay's uh, plants, and they're very popular. They grow beautiful flowers, and I may lose. I've got a really big one that I couldn't even get in the house, so fingers crossed. I'm also dehydrated. Good Lord. Uh, all right. Let's get to the questions, shall we? John Batman, Maven the Helpful Guy, Keisha Green. Good to see you, Keisha. Um, uh, Keisha, it's good to see you. Sorry. God, man, everybody is texting me right now. Kevin Lopez, this is random, but I just want to say thank you again. Like, hey, man, thank you, Kevin. I, I, hey, look, dude, I like, I, like, uh, I like what I do. It's always fun. Tolowitz in here. Yeah, Tolowitz, I grow plumerias. Uh, Tolowitz, who's uh, on the channel, is from Hawaii, and uh, he's a great guy. He's kind of funny looking, but other than that, he's all right. And uh, he knows what plumeria are. Mm hmm So Andre was celebrating yesterday. What were you celebrating, Andre? Eh, we'll figure out what that is in a minute. Uh, 2.04 p.m., Charles Montgomery. Thanks for all the videos, Mike. I passed the Net Plus last week. Big round of you, big round of applause to you, Charles Montgomery. Well done, sir. Absolutely well done. What else we got going here? Uh, Adman Ahmed, I was just watching your course on Udemy. Yep, good place to watch my courses. Uh, John Batman got four inches in Arkansas. Yeah, the center of the United States is in a, a Arctic blast. I don't know what the term it is. It's cold. Uh, Jari Trunk Life at 2.05 p.m. Hello, everyone. I just started studying for my network plus. Good. Jari, ask me some questions then. Unless you know all the answers, ask me some questions about network plus, man. We'll get you there. Mm -mm. Maven Feliciano, let's see those likes. <laughs> Maven, do you work for me? I'm starting to think you do. Sam McFarland at 206. We have six inches in St. Louis. Hey, Sam, I was born in St. Louis. Really? Right off River de Pair, down by Forest Park, if you know where I'm shooting. Um... Looking for questions. Uh, Herman Cime at 206. I'm new on IT, no experience at all. Any advices? Yes. Well, first of all, Herman, you're in the right spot. Uh, if you have no experience, that means you have many, many questions. And uh, so I'm assuming that you're familiar with CompTIA certifications and what certifications are for the IT industry. Uh, so, Herman, with that, I'd say you need to be looking towards getting certifications. That's why we're here. And um, 
Because that would be the good place to start. The other thing, Herman, you should be doing is showing up here every Monday and Wednesday and Friday also. We have Dave Rush on Fridays. I'm only Monday and Wednesdays. But Dave Rush is on Fridays at the same channel at the same time. And uh, right now, Herman, the big thing you got to do is show up and start communicating with people. You need to, you know, uh, the nice thing about certifications, and I don't even know if, what your goal is, Herman. You just said, I'm new. Uh, if you said, if you came up to me and said, I'm new, the first thing I'd say to you is, okay, welcome aboard. What do you want to do? Why are you here? You know, what's your passions? What, what are your goals? That would be the first thing I would ask you. And then based on that, we could probably start getting you pointed in some good directions. Jari, trunk life is in Oklahoma. Boy, now that's a cold state. Literally the coldest experience of my entire life was in the state of Oklahoma. I was driving a car and the fuel filter froze driving down the interstate. That's how cold it was. It literally froze my fuel filter. And uh, man, I, it's one of those things where you're so cold, you're like, I'm worried that I might die. <laughs> Norman, Oklahoma, Jari, if you know where that is. Michael Reese, back off to work computers. Back off to work. Computers can't put themselves together. Sorry, okay, Michael. Sorry I missed your takeoff. Dun, 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 dun. John Batman, recommend any... Oh, there you go. Thank you, John. You're just... Dun, 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 dun. Lots of good ones. Uh, 207, Kiera is sweet. Do you have practice exams for Network Plus? Kiera, not only do I have practice exams for Network Plus, I'm going to give some away today. So given the fact we have a pretty small crowd in here, uh, what is it, Kiera? Uh, you've got a pretty good chance of uh, doing, uh, getting yourself some free Network Plus questions. Uh, are there any topics in particular today, Maven asked me. Nope, it's, uh, we're still open. I am uh, right now still working on building up a big certification path. It has turned into a much bigger job than I thought, and I'm getting sidebarred by all kinds of things. Uh, you know, do keep in mind, Maven, the reason I have special topics on certain days is because people ask for them. So, uh, especially now, Maven, when things are, seem to be a little slow, like I have no topic for Wednesday either, just answering questions, and that's why they call it the AMA. Uh, but if you have issues that you're particularly interested in, this would be a good time to maybe submit those, uh, particularly if you send them via email, Maven. So keep that in mind. Send me an email if you have any particular topics. We did uh, last week and a little bit before, uh, of the week before, we did a lot of uh, subnetting just because people were having trouble with it. And now we have some, God, I mean, I got to tell you, I've done a ton of subnetting courses, but, you know, part of the fun of having you guys here is that I really do use you all as guinea pigs for new teaching methodologies and concepts I have. And, uh, I think that the subnet thing went really well. I think it did. And uh, I feel that uh, we've got like two, three videos that we did uh, last week and the week before. And I feel that we pretty much have exhaustively covered subnetting, at least within the scope of CompTIA exams. That's a big statement to make. Um, Andre, you're going to get a job. There you go. Uh, Zach snuck in. That's good. Andre DeGoyer, eight-year anniversary of being married to Oksana. Hey, Mazel tov. Way to go there, buddy. Marriage is a fine institution. If you're ready to be institutionalized. <laughs> Richard Bro is up in Canada. Uh, I actually love Canada. I've been to Vancouver and I've been to Toronto. Uh, and there's a good chance that I'm going to be in uh, Montreal uh, over the summer. I'm looking forward to that. Never been to Montreal. Practice my horrific French. So John Batman, you say CompTIA is a good place to start because it's a very broad cert. Uh, John, remember CompTIA is a lot of certifications. Uh, so I know we're all probably talking about CompTIA A+. I know, I know, I know. But I'm just, I'm going to be a bit of a stickler here just because we have so many people coming in some are A+, plus, Net+, plus, Security+, plus. some people are already beyond that, so, yeah, lots of them. Uh, 
Oh, that's right. Andre, you got married on Valentine's Day. Aww. Richard Bro, Mike, is there an easy way to connect a laptop to a desktop that doesn't have internet connection? Okay, Richard. Um, you can have a network connection. You don't need to be on the internet. Uh, you can have a desktop and a laptop be on the same wireless network. So I'm assuming you're talking about things like file transfer and stuff like that. Um, there are tools if you want to. Uh, there are uh, USB transfer tools. Uh, you can also, if you want to, use what's called a null modem. If both the desktop and the laptop have legitimate RJ45 ports, uh, you can make a cable. It's called a crossover cable. And uh, or you, don't, you don't even have to make one. You can buy a crossover cable. They're available everywhere. And a crossover cable, it, it, it looks like a regular piece of cable, but it's wired differently. And with the crossover cable, you can hook together two systems. You don't need a switch. You don't need nothing. Just plug them together, and they will negotiate, and you can do basic file transfers. So, yeah. But uh, you can connect anything without the internet, right? I mean, if they're physically next to each other. But honestly, if I was just like doing file transfer, Richard, I would probably connect the laptop and the desktop to a handy, convenient wireless network and just do your file transfer. So. Oh, Andre's looking at it as uh, 2 11 p.m. Andre's looking at this as uh, they're trying to. Uh, Share the intercon. I'm not sure what he was saying. Okay. Uh, 211, Jimmy Milligan. I have been given a server and managed to get it to boot up from a disk with Microsoft Server 2019. Excellent. So, Jimmy, what you need to do now is install, install server on that system. Um, a couple of things you might want to consider, Jimmy. Number one, uh, if, if you... Uh, You've been given a server. Okay, I was going to say, I'm going to, I was going to talk about virtual machines, but forget it. Looks like you have a dedicated box. And boot up from a disk. Do you mean the installation disk, or did it actually boot? I have been told that I can remote into it, therefore no need for a screen and can run virtual machine. I have been told I can remote into it. Yes, that is true. And in fact, most Windows servers, you don't sit at them and work on you remote into them using either remote desktop or SSH, depending on what you want to do. No need for a screen. Okay. I got to tell you, though, if you, uh, Jimmy, if you're learning this stuff, unless you're going to use remote desktop, I would want a screen. Uh, I want to see what I'm doing when I'm first learning about server. Uh, you can also install Windows Server without even a GUI. No desktop, no nothing. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that for somebody who's just learning it. There's a lot of really wonderful tools uh, that you can use either locally or remotely. It doesn't matter which way. But uh, I would still install that copy of Server 2019 as a full-blown install. During the installation process, it'll actually say, do you want to install a GUI or not? Say yes. Uh, and make sure you got at least 16 gig of RAM on that puppy. Uh, so you, can, you also can run a virtual machine. Now, this is the thing. If someone really gave you a server, Jimmy, that means you have a bare metal server box. I'm imagining like a 1U pizza box that you put in a rack. Uh, if you have a physical machine, then you don't want to do a virtual machine, right? I mean, you just want to, you would fire up remote desktop or whatever it is to get into the server that might be sitting in a closet, but uh, we did we did virtual machines here about two months ago. Uh, we talked about setting up virtual machine networks, and one of the operating systems we installed was Windows Server. So you might want to check those out. So guys, if you're talking to each other and not talking to me, please use that at sign because it's very helpful because I want to, if I don't see the at sign, I'm assuming that it's for me. But it looks like Jimmy and uh, John Batman around 211 were having a conversation. I've been told I can, I recommend them, them. Oh God, what's them? Don't know what that is.
Uh, okay, I'm gonna let you guys have your conversations there. Uh, okay, here's a question, 2.12 p.m. Adnan Ahmed, I find it rather complicated to differentiate between cybersecurity and network security. Uh, there, there is no difference. They're the same. They're the, I guess network security would be a subset of cybersecurity where you're talking about just securing a network. Uh, but cybersecurity is an incredibly broad topic that would certainly, in my opinion, include the term network security. How are they different? They're not. Network security is a part of cybersecurity. What is recommended to be a cybersecurity pro? An odd, a, a, Adnan, Adnan, Adnan. I'm going to get your name right. I'm very, I apologize for mispronunciations. Uh, so you want to become a cybersecurity pro. So what are you now? Adnan, are, are, you, are, are you a engineer? Uh, do you, are you a chef? You know, what are you doing? Where do you want to go? Uh, the thing that always worries me is that a lot of people come into this world and they go, oh, I've heard good things about IT security, so I want to become a IT security fanatic. And uh, I, not to make all the other guys listen to my sermon about passion and things like that, but uh, I would want to know where you're trying to go with that and what do you like. And be, on top of that, cybersecurity, there's over 360 different certifications just for cybersecurity. Everything from wireless security to window security to cloud security to all kinds of stuff in there. So it's... Uh, I don't. I don't think it's um, a, uh, a that big of an issue. Dun, 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 dun. So uh, I guess Adnan, I don't want to leave you hanging. Probably ought to take a look at the CompTIA Security Plus certification. Uh, I would even consider Network Plus before that because the Security Plus really assumes that you have a lot of knowledge about networking. So certifications are generally the place where we get ourselves started. Michael Smyers telling me that with, Kate, with I don't even need a crossover cable with gigabit ethernet. I call horse poop on that, Michael Smyer. I'm not disagreeing with you, I just don't believe it. It's a cognitive dissonance. So Michael Smyer says he's plugged a, just a regular piece of cable, I guess, between a laptop, between two machines and got a connection. Michael, I'm, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna even gonna argue with that. I think it'd go either way. Oh, looking for questions. Farag, Farag Didar. Hello, Mike. Hello, man. Welcome aboard. Uh, John Batman. Actually, Total Seminars Channel, your works have come very recommended by several Redditors along with Jason Dion. Yeah, no, guys, I got to tell you, when it comes to IT training of any form, the more sources you can get, the better. Uh, I think Jason Dion has a pretty good program. Mine's better, but he's got a great program. Uh, and uh, having multiple sources is always a good idea. Uh, you know, one of the big things I always tell people is that if you want to pass any IT certification, you have to have a practice bank of exams. And uh, I sell them. Uh, I'm sure Jason Dion sells them, uh, uh, Cyber Vista. There's a lot of names out there. People who sell practice examinations for you to practice from. And uh, that is the most important thing you can have. There is nothing more important than practice questions. Because with practice questions, if you get a question you don't understand, even if you don't have study material, you can at least Google it, uh, which is uh, good. Now, obviously, I think people should also have videos. I think people should also have books. That's my opinion. And uh, I've gotten a lot of people through CompTIA certifications with that attitude, so I'm sticking to it. Yeah, maybe in uh, 214, I'll see what I'd like to cover. Yeah, maybe just ask questions, man. It's all good. Dan Richards sneaking in under the gun. Uh, Rock to auto magically. You like my terms? I like auto magically. Herman Sime, I have heard a lot about IT in general. Tired of my parking attendant job. All right, now, I'm, now I hear you, man. I would like to discover the IT, work on my own as a freelancer. Do you think language can be a barrier? I'm a French speaker. Nah, Herman, God, geez. 
lots of French speaking countries need IT support just like any place else. Uh, honestly, most of the time, uh, I'm trying to quickly think of some French companies that have uh, English. I can't quickly think of anything. There's lots of them. I'm just going blank. Take a look at some companies based in France or a French speaking world where they need uh, bilingual people. That's always a big thing, man. If you can speak more than one language, you got to keep in mind, I'm from America, you know. <clears throat> I speak English, passable Spanish, horrific French, and nightmarish German. So uh, I'm not bilingual, but anytime somebody has the, uh, the skill at two or more languages, they should definitely be taking advantage of that. Told them it's sneaker net. So I got to say, that's not the worst possible idea. You can, that's not it. I'll pretend like it is. Uh, being able to transfer files even between that laptop and the desktop using like an external hard drive, things like that, that's not the worst. Uh, Maven at 217. Can you use HDMI and Bluetooth as well as connecting devices? HDMI? Maven and I have had no experience using HDMI as a data transfer methodology. I'm not saying it doesn't do it, I'm just saying I'm not familiar with it. Uh, Bluetooth would probably work if uh, both devices had a Bluetooth. Not a lot of desktops have Bluetooth, but if you did have Bluetooth, uh, that would probably work. It'd be a little slow, but that'd be the worst I could complain. Uh, Richard, to make it simple, I'd like to do RDP without the desktop being Wi-Fi capable. Okay, yeah, Richard, in that case, you're gonna have to have some kind of connection. Uh, so if you don't want it to be Wi-Fi capable, you're probably going to need to look towards Ethernet. Would probably be the easiest way to go about that. Andras sneaks in. Hey guys, the 221. So Richard, you're you're saying that there's no way to connect connect to the internet. Well, sure there is. Go get yourself 100 feet of RJ40, sorry, 60 meters of, uh, RJ, of Ethernet cable, go to the back thing, plug it in, and let the cable go flop around. This seems to be, oh, you want to use this as a remote desktop. And you don't want any wires running through your floors, right? You realize that this machine that I'm talking to you on literally has a wire running across my dining room? It's COVID, man. Uh, but you're going to have to give it some kind of connectivity. And there's nothing wrong with putting wireless on a Windows server. It, it works fine. There's also some uh, good follow-up uh, questions in there, Richard. You might want to read what some of the other folks are saying, too. Michael Smyer at uh, 223. Never, uh, never under underestimate the bandwidth of a station wagon full of tapes hurling down the highway. That is a classic. Silas, 223 p.m. How's it going? Hope you're doing well. I am. Uh, we're doing it. We're cold. But other than that, we're doing okay. Just want to let you know I sent Kathy an email about the prize last week and haven't heard a... Oh, dude, Silas, just keep on top of her. Silas, we're not a big company. We're a little mom and pop organization, okay? And we don't have a lot of people. And uh, here, Silas, I will check on that for you. I don't understand. Silas, tell me where you live, bud. You know, do keep in mind that there are some situations where we have trouble getting books to people. Uh, but I will, I will check with Kathy. On your behalf, sir. Mm -hmm. Cheeky Willie at 2.24 p.m. Mike Myers, I appreciate you spending your time answering questions. That's what I'm here for, man. I purchased both your Net Plus Security Plus Class of Beauty, books from McGraw-Hill, currently halfway through Net Plus. Cheeky, you still need practice questions. Andreas, Uncle Mike. <laughs> Booked my core one to Wednesday afternoon. What performance-based questions can I expect? A plus core one. Pretty simple ones, you know. 
make sure you know that uh, virtual machines need a lot more RAM than a regular desktop computer. And uh, you know, a, a gaming machine is gonna need a better video card than a regular office machine. You know, little stuff like that. Uh, the big thing I can tell you about, two things about the performance-based questions today. Number one, most of the performance-based questions are far simpler than they look. Uh, you'll start reading them, especially remember the performance-based questions come right at the beginning of your exam. So you're gonna get these performance-based questions and they're gonna be complicated. You gotta take a minute and look at them, understand what the graphics are trying to say. They are not hard questions. They are, in my opinion, often some of the easiest questions on the exam are the performance-based questions. The challenge you run into is when you first see these questions is you've got to take a moment and make sure you understand what they're asking for. You usually have to pull up a graphic, so you're switching back and forth in the test between some kind of graphic and the place where you're answering things. That's okay. Take a little bit of time, make sure you understand what they're trying to ask of you, make sure you're ready for that type of stuff, and then go ahead and answer the question. The opposite to that, and this is a big problem people run into, particularly with A+, is that the performance-based questions can end up eating a lot more time than you think. So if you are more than, say, 15 minutes into the test and you're still on the performance-based questions, you probably ought to go ahead and move on. Remember, yeah, it, um, for A-plus, it's 90 minutes. So yeah, about 15 minutes. You can always come back to them later. Edward showing up. There he is. Uh, Rob GJR. What's the average time people take on studying for the A plus? I don't have any, you know, CompTIA wide statistics for that. I basically tell most people that they need to study for A plus in general about. 220 hours of study time. So however that slices up for you. Uh, there are programs here in the United States that will teach you the entire A plus in 16 hours. <laughs> They're not good. Uh, on the low end, if you were skilled, like you knew this stuff, and you were just like practicing what's on the exam, maybe four, 40, 40 hours of study. Uh, I've seen people take 800 hours of study. It, it becomes a matter of personal uh, taste. Oh, and by the way, uh, Rob GJR, if you look at uh, like my A plus book, at the very front of the book, I write out a big table that helps you calculate the number of hours you're gonna need to study. So that might be something you wanna consider. Oh goodness, 226 Guillermo. Mon Moreno, God, I know you, Guillermo. I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name. Can you describe the boot sequence, like bootloader, boot sector, etc.? How are we doing on time? It's only 2:30. Sure. Uh, let's talk about booting things. So, in order for a mass storage device to be bootable, it has to be uh, partitioned and formatted in such a way that it has a uh, boot partition. I'm sorry. Don't lie. So that it has a boot sector. So remember that all hard drives are chopped up into sectors, okay? And a sector is usually 4,096 bytes. Now, uh, yeah, I know, they used to be 512 back in the old days. So within that sector, this is where I wish I had a whiteboard, Ben. So within that sector, you have, uh, you've got your uh, boot information. I wanna make sure we're using we have the bootloader, and then in that bootloader, then you also have uh, X number of uh, partitions in there, and that's known as the partition table. So you really only have two big pieces to the boot sector. The bootloader, which initiates whatever that operating system needs to get going, and then some type of partition table that decides where things are, okay? And now I'm gonna be talking about more modern, what are called GPT uh, drives. Uh, as opposed to something much older called uh, MBR. And uh, so when you boot up, the first thing that happens is that uh, your boot sector is a physical place. It is the zero sector on every hard drive. And when your computer boots up, 
as the bias is looking for boot sectors on anything, it's looking on, are there any thumb drives installed, any optical media, whatever, in your bias, you set up a boot uh, order and it, it bias goes through it, and it's looking for bootloaders, all right? And what eventually gets to, let's just go with a hard drive, uh, it will just, in essence, kind of like drop the needle as part of the boot process. And if there isn't a bootable operating system there, you get a uh, no, boot divide, no boot drive or system present or something like that. Um, so that it, it goes into the, the bootloader. The bootloader then takes a look at whatever is the currently active partition, uh, which in the Windows universe is almost invariably the first drive or what we call a C drive, and it begins to boot off of that particular drive. So there is a passover from where bias is running to the point where it recognizes a boot sector on, in the boot order and starts to boot from that boot sector. The moment that happens, it's no longer a bias issue. We're now loading an operating system. So we're going to assume the operating system's in good order. So bootloader takes a look at the partition table, sees which partition is active. It's almost always gonna be the first one. And it, right there, it just starts scooping up data. Uh, and what's happening there is the operating system now begins to load critical files. And I'm a little rusty on, I should know this stuff, hang on. I'm a little rusty on this part. I gotta do some quick research. Can't remember. It's NTOS loader. Oh, Michael Smyer, can you save me on this one? I can't remember the darn. We've got a lot of questions. Oof. All right. I'm going to leave it at there for right now. Uh, Guillermo, I've got. You know what, Guillermo? I'm looking for something to do on Wednesday. Let's do boot order on Wednesday. I'll get my notes in front of me so I know I'm not lying to you. Wednesday, just for my buddy Guillermo, we're going to do boot order. How's that sound? That way we can have a little bit more fun. We can get a little bit more into UEFI and a few things like that. I know it's going to be more interesting for you guys. You got it. Wednesday, I'm your boy. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm not missing questions, guys. John Batman pushing exam compass. I'm not as familiar with those. Uh, Abhe Sani, can we ask anything? Uh, I don't want to talk about uh, politics or religion or sex, but other than that, yes, I'll talk about it. Angel Frias, that's a big cat. Did Jack walk by? Kitty, kitty, kitty. Did Jack walk by? Oh, that's good. Jack is sometimes my co-anchor. Mm. Mike, do you mind any crypto? No, I do not mind crypto. I do not. Uh, I got some buddies who do. Pretty hilarious setup. Uh, it's in a private home, and uh, they got a double load of ASICs and some old GPUs and such. And it's hilarious house because it's basically racks, air conditioner units in all the windows, lots of pizza boxes, one sofa, trash everywhere and like an 83 inch television, they're hilarious. But no, I don't, I don't mind, I don't do any mining. Guillermo Moreno, Mike, due to COVID, 
Is it better to take the exam at home or in person? Can you go over the differences? So you mean due to COVID, is it better to take the exam at home or at a testing center, right? I, that's what you meant. Uh, this is Guillermo Moreno at 2.30 p.m. Can you go over the difference? Uh, there's not, it's the exact same test, Guillermo. There's no difference whatsoever. If you go to a testing center, either way, uh, you got to go to uh, view, vue.com, Pearson, pearsonview.com. And so you pay money and you sign up for the exams. Okay, so that's the first thing. And uh, uh, man, I'm going, the website to take the at home test is called OnView, O N V U E dot com. The uh, when when you take an exam at an exam center, you go to the exam center. There's a there's a person there, and you sign in, and they you know hand you some scratch paper, and they sit you down at a particular cubicle, and you take the exam, and then you run through it, and either you pass or you fail. The at home is a little bit more complicated in that you have to kind of do a test beforehand to make sure everything's going to work okay. Little things like if you were to plug in or unplug a USB or an HDMI while the test is running, your test is immediately flushed. So you don't jack with any hardware when you're taking the test at home. Uh, you have to take pictures of the room that you're going to be taking the test in so they know you don't have walls of cheat sheets behind the camera or whatever it might be. And, uh, but other than that, it works pretty much the same. Uh, you don't get scratch paper when you're taking it at home. They just basically pull up notepad on your screen and you can make notation there. Uh, but I think those are really the only, it costs the same. It's the exact same exam, same amount of time, same everything. Silas lives in the Netherlands. Hey. Silas, unfortunately, we don't have anybody else from the Netherlands here. We got somebody from Belgium, but that's about it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, John Batman's adding an extra point about the taking home. It does have to be in quiet environment. Yeah. Giant wedges of cheese at 2.32 p.m., what do you think the future holds for IPv6 implementation? It's just going to keep going the way it is. I mean, I got to tell you, I would say that a substantial percentage of people, even today, if you turned off IPv6 in a internet web browsing experience, I don't think you'd notice any difference. Uh, IPv6 is very dominant. All the DNS is there now. Uh, it's hard pressed to come up with a web server that doesn't support IPv6. Uh, the big, the big problem with IPv6 for the longest time, and I guess still is to this, to some extent, is that, um, a lot of ISPs until like, let's say within the last four to five years, didn't support IPv6. You couldn't get IPv6 at home. Uh, that doesn't seem to be a case anymore. If there are internet service providers out there who are not providing IPv6 to the individual customers, I'm not aware of them. That's not saying they're not there, I just don't know them. Uh, but IPv6 is here. IPv6 is so much easier to use than IPv4. Subnetting becomes trivial. You don't have to figure out subnet mass. Everything's a WAC64. Um, be, with router advertisements, everything is self-configuring. So the idea of using DHCP is not all the way gone, but almost gone. They still use DHCP for some DNS stuff. But if you had a choice between supporting an IPv4 environment or an IPv6 environment, you would find supporting the IPv6 environment to be much easier, much more self-configuring, much more self-regulating and uh, more robust than IPv4. Uh, all operating systems support IPv6. Every IoT device I can think of, including my webcams and my Nest thermostats and uh, Google Home and all these other toys, they all support IPv6. 
IPv6 is a very, very good thing, and I am thrilled to see it quickly becoming a big part of the internet because, man, does it make my life a lot easier. Uh, no, no. Abe, Sani, these, these days universities are using AI to conduct exams that's causing many problems for students. What are your views? If that's not your area, that's okay, but I'd still like some input. I don't have a whole lot of input there. So uh, Abe, the only thing I'm gonna say is using AI to conduct exams. Now we definitely, and there's even some stuff on Security Plus about messing with uh, AI systems to mess them up. Uh, but that's about as far as my experience there goes. So, you know what? I'm going to be safe and just back up a little bit. Tolowit, another file transfer option could be IPOAC. IP Is that what I think it means? Hang on. Let me do a quick search. <laughs> IPOAC, IP over. Avian carriers using pigeons? No. Look, just tell the guy to put a cable in. He'll be all right. Silas has a question 233. We're about to have a competition, guys. Oh, Mike, did I? Oh, Mike, I did have a Security Plus 501 question. Look at you being all accurate. I don't quite grasp the difference between buffer overflow and integer overflow. I don't understand when something is SQL injection or XSS. Oh God, is there a time I wish I could just take Michael Smyre, who's right now helping me here and put his face up here. Uh, Michael's better at me than this, but I'll, I'll, I, can, I can give you a, a good idea to get you started at least. Where'd it go? Okay. So, uh, when we use the term buffer in, in IT, we're talking usually about some memory space that is set aside for something, all right? Uh, we set aside memory space to keep track of where all the windows are uh, on your Windows desktop, for example. And there is a specified amount of space for that. And if a situation takes place where we end up using more space than that buffer allows, it can cause a system to do strange and bizarre things, which is something that people who want to do pen testing very much want to do. Windows systems were famous for having buffer overflows that would cause them to reboot. Pretty much all fixed now, but uh, I mean, that would be the type of thing where a buffer overflow. An integer overflow, I would argue that an integer overflow would be a subset of buffer overflow, but for a very, very, very specific place. When you write code, you declare variables. And the variables could be, you know, divine variable string equals last name. So there's, so when you create a variable, you have to say what kind of data is going to go in that variable. And they have names like uh, string, which is basically you can put almost anything in there, integer, uh, long integer, uh, God, I'm forgetting so many of the, uh, Complex numbers is called a, oh, I forget what it is. God, Michael Smyers texting so much. Uh, so if you can overflow that integer variable, in essence, it's really not a buffer, but it is a buffer. When you declare a variable, the program will set aside a little bit of memory for that variable space. And if you can put like, so for example, with a lot of, uh, programming languages, an integer cannot be more than 65,536. Just throw that out as an example. Whether that's still true today, I'm Michael Smyers right now freaking out because I'm saying this probably. But if you put a bigger number in there than that variable can handle, then you declared the wrong kind of variable. And again, things that are unpredictable start to happen. So the right answer is to prevent integer overflow, for example, Make sure you have the right kind of variable for that integer. You might be storing an integer value, but because it's huge, you might have to be able to use a, oh, come on, Michael Spire, what do you call it? If it's not an integer, it's like, a, it's a big storage area. I can't remember the name of it. So I would argue that a 
integer overflow would be equivalent to a buffer overflow, that a integer overflow would be a tiny one example of something being overflowed. How's that? We'll see if anybody disagrees with me. <laughs> Thank you for using the at signs, guys. It really helps. Big Mike. Hey, Big Mike at 2.37 p.m. How are we doing on time? Eh, I'm not that far behind. All right, we really are about to have a competition. Three o'clock or till the questions round. Let's see what happens. Big Mike. Hey, Mike. Hey, Big Mike. I'm currently working on CompTIA A plus certification with your course. Good. I was wondering if you have any advice for a next step certification for a tech fresh out of high school. Thanks. Network plus. Not even hard. Uh, there is no law of physics out there. There's no law of man. But most people consider... CompTIA A+, CompTIA Network+, CompTIA Security+, Plus, to be the three starting certifications. Um, you could go even before that, and arguably it would be the CompTIA uh, uh, INET+. Plus. I always forget the name of that one. But those three certifications, A+, Net+, Plus, Security+, Plus, provide that core base of knowledge that once you get through Security+, Plus, then you're probably going to want to specialize and you're gonna look for other stuff, like maybe you wanna become a Cisco head, maybe you wanna become a wireless nut, maybe you wanna become a cloud freak, whatever it is, those three certifications will serve you well. So that's where I would start. No, 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 John Bat, what's your opinion on Star, what the, Starlink? I don't even know what Starlink is. Let me look it up. <laughs> Starlink is available to, I don't know anything about Starlink, and I should. I got buddies at NASA. I don't know nothing. Sorry, man. Yeah, no Scott today, guys. Scott has no electricity in his home. So uh, Michael Smyer has been kind enough to help out today, and we do appreciate it very, very much. Scott has no power, are you kidding? Scott has all the power. Uh, Silas at 238, I have another question. Is there any particular position you'd recommend for someone who just got Security Plus certified? Yeah, anything you can get, Silas. Uh, no, there isn't a particular position. Uh, a few months ago, we did a wonderful uh, video with my friend Jessica Dickerson, and she was talking about entry-level jobs for uh, IT security. And a big job that a lot of people get if they want to really punch straight into security, which you don't have to do, but if you want to, uh, they usually end up monitoring, doing real-time monitoring of, you know, 1,500 customers at once. And, uh, you know, you're working the midnight till 8 in the morning shift, watching monitors for lights to go red to see, you know, what button you have to press. But uh, the, the, the thing is, I was, get a job. Uh, there's tons of entry-level jobs out there, uh, and uh, go for them. Like, Silas, I, I don't know you from Adam, but if you were living here in Houston, Texas, and uh, you had bilateral symmetry, and you could speak uh, English halfway well, and you know how to use soap and a deodorant and a comb, uh, the, there's lots of jobs out there, certainly in the Houston area. Oh, poor Alex. So my, my friend Alice, she doesn't have her buddy Scott with us today. You're going to have to put up with me, Chicolita. Tolowit, did you see LTT's 12-kilometer Wi-Fi video? That could work too, yeah. Uh, yeah, they've got some pretty long-distance Wi-Fi these days. I think the record Wi-Fi is now, I don't know, 230 miles or something like that. What would that be, like uh, just shy of 400 kilometers? always cracks me up when people are like, 
you Americans should use the metric system. Us Americans, other than buying gasoline or, well, I even use kilograms when I weigh myself. Uh, Americans use metric like crazy, like crazy we use it. Buying gasoline is still in gallons, you know. A lot of foods are still in imperial standards, but a lot of foods even here in the United States, uh, you wanna buy a Coca-Cola, you will get a two liter bottle. They don't have gallon bottles of Coca-Cola. So uh, even though I would probably have to say that imperial units are my first language, I'm extremely comfortable with the metric system, it's, it, particularly when you start to get into energy, work, force. I mean, once you see a Newton, you will never go back to a foot pound or whatever the heck it is in Imperial. So yeah, I, most Americans that I know, especially the STEM, the techies, we're extremely comfortable with the metric system. Oh, now I see what told. They claim Scott has no power. Yeah. Uh, no, we didn't fire him. We just put him back in the carbonite. That way you don't have to feed him. He's no good to me, Dad. Uh, 240. Okay, in three minutes we're going to start our first competition. Should I need to disconnect or disassembly a whole computer or mobile device and reassemble them in purpose of learning? Yes. Uh, in particular, I'm not saying you have to be... See, again, I have to ask, what's your goal? You want to pass a CompTIA a certification? You could probably get away without ever uh, assembling or disassembling a computer. There'd be a lot of part memorization, but you could do it. Uh, in terms of getting out there in the world, yeah, you need to do that. I do need to say, and this is really important, that probably the most trivial part of any part of computing technology That'd be anything from a server to a webcam is the most trivial part is the physical assembly. That tends to be fairly trivial. Uh, it's far more difficult, in my opinion, to do what you need to do at a keyboard. Uh, the nice thing about parts in the PC universe is that almost all the parts are designed in such a way that it is extremely difficult to plug the wrong part into the wrong slot. Uh, it can happen. Uh, I have seen USB pushed into RJ45s. I had a guy, I had a call once, this is engineer. He calls me up on the phone, he goes, Mike, I have put 10 CD-ROMs in this computer and none have come out. I was like, I'll be right there, man. So I go run down there, and here's this, this guy's a master's degree in engineering, okay? It's not a stupid person. And he's got uh, optical media, all right? It's a few years ago. And on his desktop system, the, the little spacer bars, there was just a little bit of gap between two of these spacers, uh, five and a quarter inch slots, and that looked to the engineer like the right place, and he's like, okay, now watch this, Mike, here's a demonstration, so here's a CD, now watch, and he's dropping them in there. It almost sounds like razor blades or a pachingo machine. Ding, dong, bang, 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 bang. I'm <laughs> just like, okay. So I showed him the cup holder. It's an old joke. So Herman, I think you should try. Now keep in mind, Herman, so you're thinking to yourself, oh, geez, Mike's now telling me to go buy thousands of dollars worth of equipment. I am not. Okay, like uh, Herman, if you're here in the States and Her I, you know, I don't know who's in the States or not, so I always have to put that caveat in there. But like here in the States, we have a web page called Craigslist, a website. And uh, it's local people who are trying to buy and sell stuff. And um, you would be shocked how older equipment, and remember, if you're just playing for parts, you don't even, they don't even have to work. And uh, all good computer techs have a pile of computer equipment. It happens. I've got three closets full. And uh, I don't even tell you what I got at the office. So just like the practice of snapping in, like you get an old desktop system that's still got old DDR2 in it. Well, uh, it still snaps in like DDR4. 
different number of pins, but understanding the it, understand you, you recognize that this, this is RAM, for example, little things like that, that even if you're working with non-functional parts, uh, you can get that. So I go to Craigslist. There's a couple of other local ones here in the Houston area, and I can get just about all the parts I want to play with. And the other shocker is, is I would say that 90% 90, 90 of all the computer equipment that's sold is broken works fine. I once got... Uh, I'll lie. 20 monitors. All the monitors were dead. I plugged in each monitor individually, and on half of them, all I had to do was turn up the brightness, and they all came live. So. so 241, Richard Bro. Uh, Richard, Michael Smyer is telling me that you don't even need a crossover. So Richard, what I'd recommend is if you just have a regular patch cable, now it has to be gigabit ethernet, but pretty much everything's gigabit these days. Try a regular cable before you run out and get a crossover. Give it a try. It, if it works, it pretty much just works. Jimmy Milligan, that's a good Wednesday topic. What was I gonna do for Wednesday? Boot order. I couldn't use the USB to boot up, so I had to use a disk to boot up and install server. To... Yeah, uh, Jimmy, I can almost guarantee you, you just didn't go into BIOS and check your boot order. But yeah, we'll do that. We'll do exactly that. Keep in mind, though, Jimmy, what, uh, what Maven was asking for. Let me write Maven down, because he was, was it Maven? I'm going to gamble it was you, Maven. Uh, so we're talking about boot order. Yeah, we'll go into BIOS and talk about boot order there. But I also want to talk about the boot loader and all the different parts that go. I've got some good PowerPoints on that, so we can do that. So, Michael Smyre, did you see Alex said hello to you, bud? All right. All right, let's start our first competition. It's 302. Anybody want to do a competition? If you want to do a competition, say, I want to do a competition. Type it in. We have a small group today. It's all right. Elaine Batzer just showed up. Man, everybody's here today. All right, let's do some competition. You guys ready? Let me pull up some questions. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really ready. God, you got to be interested in the Starlink now. I'm going to have to check that out. I'll tell you what, for the, to keep everything fair, what we're going to do today is I'm going to do A plus questions. Is that okay? Because I know we had a lot of new, new faces today that are interested in A+. So let's do something that you guys can enjoy. I'm looking for questions. Bear with me. Okay, we're loading them up. You guys ready? Here we go. Oh, hey, I got the question bank up. And by the way, guys, these questions are actually from my practice test bank. This is the exact same questions as if you bought this. Oh, my goodness, I forgot to mention this to you guys. Uh, whoop, where'd my phone go? Just because you guys were nice enough to show up today uh, you get access to all right. So we have 20% off all of our ebooks. So that's A plus, Net plus, Security plus ebooks. And the Security plus includes these are the passport ebooks. So this is Don Dunkerley's Security plus 601 book. Oh, if anybody's interested, Scott and I shipped off the last chapter of 601 to McGraw Hill. Uh, yesterday, so the big book's going to come. This is the, the this is the uh, the the little book, as we say, the cram book. I don't like to use that word, but we'll use that. Anyway, you get twenty percent off either the A plus, Net plus, or Security plus 
Passport eBooks. All you got to do, and Michael Smyer, I need you to type this in while I'm talking. All you got to do is go to www.totalsem.com. Head over to our merchant area. Grab yourself one, two, three, sixty eBooks. And just before you check out, you type in the code 021521. Michael Smyer, I'm hoping you got that. Let me, I'm going to pull Teams up, make sure he got that. Okay. But anyway, it's 20% off on eBooks, and I, I think it's an amazing deal. I'm also going to warn you that Wednesday we're also going to have a discount on practice questions. So be aware. Okay, so here it is. Time for our first question. Let's just go for it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Okay, you guys ready? Okay, so here's how these things work. Number one, these competitions are not fair. Just know that, okay? Uh, when I give a question, uh, it's gonna be a multiple choice question. Don't just write A, B, C, or D. Try to write out enough of the actual question. You'll see the answers. Try to write out enough of the answers so I can make sense what you're trying to say. Also keep in mind that just because you think you're first, that doesn't mean you are. Everybody's chat windows are different. So if so, you beat somebody else and I say they're the winner, because it, it looks to me like they're the winner. Okay, so let's go ahead and give this a try. You guys ready? Here we go. Dun -dun -dun -dun. There we go. When you start up a desktop PC, the power supply fan runs, but there's no activity on screen and the drives are not spinning up nor are there any beep codes. So of these four, which is the most likely problem? Defective motherboard or CPU, defective video card, defective RAM, or dead hard disk drive? Now keep in mind, a lot of these can be argued for, okay? So I'm gonna let you guys type in what you guys think the answers are. No on-screen activity, drives do not spin up. Okay, we got some answers, and we have a winner, too. Okay, so for me, the answer is it's going to be a defective motherboard or CPU. There's some pretty good clues here. Number one, we know we're getting electricity. The, the power supply fan's running, so we know we got spin going. Uh, there is no activity on screen. Now, there's a clue right there. That could be a defective video card. Uh, but the drives are also not spinning up and there's no beep codes. There's a, there is a beep code for no video card present. Beep, 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 beep. Okay, so it cannot be defective video card in my opinion. Now again, guys, the second most common reason that people fail CompTIA exams is because they know too much. And I'll bet there's some of you out there that could really make a pressing issue that says, well, it's a defective video card. Well, that's not how you answer CompTIA questions if you want to get through the test in 90 minutes. Go with the most simple answer. Keep it simple, stupid. Kiss, as we say, all right? Uh, defective RAM, defective RAM, depending on how it's defective, but most of the time when defective RAM is noticed uh, by a system, you get this be all, be all, be all, and it never stops. It's pretty universal on almost all systems. Uh, dead hard disk drive, absolutely not. We would definitely get a start beep code, letting us know the system kicked in, and we'd almost get something on the screen that would probably say, no boot device present. Uh, and again, you know, I know some of you guys would argue, go, well, Mike, you know, it could start reading the hard drive and then just get really messed up and it would, you know, not be able to do anything. Eh, you know, yeah, maybe, but the easy answer is almost certainly going to be a defective motherboard or CPU. In particular, the big clue here is if a motherboard is defective, you're not going to be able to run a power on self-test. There will be no beep codes. There will be no activity on screen. So the right answer is defective motherboard or CPU. And I have as my winner, where to go? Andres Neary. Andres, to you, congratulations. You have won your choice of either an A plus, net plus, or security plus practice questions. Security plus practice question. Yeah, okay, we'll do security plus. And um, Andres, in order to get your prize, you have to go to our, uh, send an email to Kathy Y, that's K-A-T-H-Y-Y -Y at totalsem.com. 
Don't panic. Michael Smyre will type all this into the chat window. Just send Kathy Yale uh, an email saying, I'm one of the winners on Monday. Give me free access to either A+, Net+, Plus, or Security+. Plus. Keep in mind, these are an online product. They have a limited time window. It's either 90 or 180 days, and I keep forgetting to ask Kathy. That's simple, simple one. But anyway, congratulations to you. We've got one winner so far. Silas, does the keep it simple, stupid thing also count for Security+. Plus? It's even more important in Security+. Plus. Oh, come on, let's have some fun. I got some disagreement. I always enjoy disagreement. Chunkier fish. RAM is always crucial to check in diagnostics. Some people just follow the Geek Squad example through, open the side of the case, poke around for ones and zeros, and let the customer know they have a dead MOBO. They do. I've seen that happen, Chunkier Fish, and I won't argue with you that uh, bad RAM can often be diagnosed as a bad motherboard. My two challenges to that is number one, bad RAM has a definitive post error that's famous. So that would be my first thing. You can have RAM that is so bad that it would interfere with the post. That does happen. But again, chunkier, this is one of these things where you can be technically correct, but have no friends. Uh, stick with the, the motherboard, you, you'll be better off. Oop. Hey, you guys want to do it again? Let's do it again. Ooh, this is a great question. All right, you guys want to do it again? One more time? You ready? Here we go. Oh no, we're buffering? Am I buffering? Guys, I've done, I work so hard to not buffer. Uh, 3.12 p.m. My name is Lola. Hello, Lola. I'm glad you're here. All right, well, I, we're just go, we're gonna risk it. Here we go, guys. Second question, here we go. Is everybody ready? Here comes the second question. What category of hypervisor is Oracle VirtualBox? What category of hypervisor is Oracle VirtualBox? Is it type one, type two, bare metal, or guest? Crazy homebody girl, you never type in the letters, you gotta type in the answer. I'm giving folks a chance to answer the question. Uh, how embarrassing is this? I forgot. I mean, I know it's either type one or type two, but I forget. Yeah, I know, Mike Myers forgot something. How hilarious is that? Hang on, let me see if my buddy Michael Smyre is gonna bail me out faster than I can look it up. Yes, type two, thank you, Michael. I knew it was a type two, but I got paranoid. All right, so the right answer is it's a type two hypervisor. Type two hypervisors run on top of a host operating system. VirtualBox is designed to run on top of uh, Windows or Linux. You can't run a uh, virtual box on bare metal. There are other hypervisors, more serious hypervisors, like VMware, for example, have type one hypervisors. You literally install VMware as the operating system, okay? And the only thing that computer's gonna be able to do is host virtual machines. So the type one hypervisor, there is no Host operating system, type two, hop, type two hypervisor means you've got some operating system and then you install the hypervisor as an application like VirtualBox. All right, so we got some winners. Let's see, who do we got? All right, so I've got as a winner, Dan Richards. Dan Richards, congratulations to you, sir. You have won either uh, A+, Net+, or Security+. Practice questions. 
In order to uh, retrieve your prize, Dan Richards, all you've got to do is go to dub, uh, English, not my first language today. Okay, so all you got to do, Dan, is go to uh, send an email to Kathy Y, K-A-T-H-Y-Y, at Total7.com. Let her know you're one of today's winners, and she will send you access to either, and you got to let her know. You want A+, plus, not plus, security plus. Tell her what you want, and then she'll give you access. How's that for easy? So we got two winners. We're going to have one more competition, but not yet, because I have a lot of questions today. This is great, but I got a lot of questions. All right. Uh, Michael Smyer brought up that when you set up AWS servers, you don't get IPv6 by default. Michael Smyer, I just set up an E2C instance. Why, just the other day. And I don't remember that being the case. I'm going to trust you, Michael. All right, so there's one place where IPv6 may not show up by default. That's if you're setting up to a cloud. Yeah, Michael Smyer is also bringing up the DHCP v6. Yes, uh, DHCP is still used. Remember I said, Michael, I said it's used in some cases for like DNS. Eddie Lagos, will we ever run out of IPv6 addresses? Yes, the moment every nanobot needs its own unique IPv6 address for the entire atmosphere of the Earth, then maybe, but not before then. It's funny, though. I mean, when they invented IPv4 a billion years ago, uh, you know, they, had, they created an address space of 4 billion addresses, 2 to the 32nd power. And uh, at the time when that was being developed, they must have thought to themselves, oh my gosh. Well, you know, the internet could be up to 10,000 computers one day. That's what they visualize is this massive address space. And uh, who'd have thunk it, right? And then the internet became what it is. So. I've learned a long time ago to never say never in the IT industry. Uh, Bill Gates' famous phrase, 640K of RAM is all that anyone will ever need, you know, that type of thing. So, um, Maven Feliciano, a bit off topic. Any thoughts on the Gemini Internet Protocol? I don't even know what this is. You guys are literally, I'm having to write up a study sheet here, all this stuff. I don't know what the Gemini Internet Protocol is. but I'm gonna check it out. Thanks for the information. Anybody, anytime I think that I'm like this geezer who knows everything, man, I, every day I learn something new in this industry, kids. Kira Sweet, can you explain the difference between vulnerability scanning and penetration scanning? Uh, Kira, it's not a huge difference. Uh, they use the same tools uh, in general, but a vulnerability scan is, is usually done in-house. You're doing internal things to check your network, to look for vulnerabilities. Um, whereas a penetration scan, I don't like the word penetration scanning, it's penetration testing. Whereas penetration testing is almost always done by some external third party, or it could be somebody within your organization, but they act externally. And then they're trying to do, they're trying to penetrate your network. Uh, but again, a vulnerability, it's really vulnerability assessment is the better term. If I've used the word vulnerability scanning, I apologize, Kira. It's, vulner, it's, it's vulnerability assessment and penetration testing. And it's pretty much the same activities. With um, penetration testing also usually allows uh, for some type of capture the flag where the, you're allowed to go in. With a vulnerability assessment, you're usually not allowed to actually take advantage of the vulnerability. You just recognize the vulnerability and fix it. Whereas with pen testing, not only will they see a vulnerability, but they'll take advantage of it. That's why it's so important in pen testing environments is the amount of written, documented permissions is critical because you're basically paying people to commit a felony here in the United States. So uh, we're very, very careful about that. Ooh, this is great. You, you even got Michael Smyre confused on the Gemini protocol. That makes me feel good because Michael Smyre is kind of like this huge brain that knows everything. 
Uh, Ulysses Frere, hey, Uncle Mike. <laughs> Any discounts on vouchers? Total Seminars always has discounts on vouchers. Uh, it's not a huge discount, but we give you what we can. Uh, it's about it's just under about a 10% discount. You can get discount vouchers from Total Seminars anytime. Just go over to www.totalsem.com and pick yourself up a couple of vouchers. Eh, it's only about 10%, but it still saves you some money. Uh, Michael Smyre, you're, you're spoiling me. So Michael has gone through the chat windows and has got everybody's question lined up here on Teams to the side. This is incredibly convenient. Thanks, Michael. I'm, I'm not even looking at the, well, here, I'll look at the chat window. I don't want to sit here and say I'm not looking. Don't want to be a big liar. Okay. Uh, 2.58 p.m., Endless Mindset. Hey, Mike, what do you think is the most lucrative IT career going into the future? I've heard DevOps engineer. Oh, Endless Mindset. Some of the wealthiest people I know are plumbers. <coughs> they're wealthy because they're good at plumbing and they're good business people. It has nothing to do with plumbing being a good career or bad career. It's because they have passion, they're good, they have integrity, they have skill, they have speed, they have professionalism, and you will always do well. I don't care what you're doing if you have those qualities about you. There is no exception to that. Um, I mean, chief information security officer is going to be way up there. That's going to be a quarter million a year. Uh, you know, it, it's probably be, you have to wear a tie to get to the big money in general. In fact, one of the lowest paid positions in IT security of the end jobs, pen testers don't make a ton of money. And it's hard work. You live on an airplane. You have cruddy hours. Yeah, it's fun to hack other people's networks. Uh, 2.58 p.m., Angel Santos. Does CompTIA A-plus exams give partial points for not getting all simulations? Angel, we don't know. And we have researched this and tried to get an answer. It is our impression that they do provide partial credit. This is based on our own experience from taking the exams. We don't know this to be a fact but it does look like CompTIA provides partial uh, credit for performance-based questions. Oh, Michael Smyer, I forgot to show the, oh, here, come on. Just, I, guys, Michael Smyer, who's helping out today, actually wrote the interface for our exams. So I wanna show him off a little bit. Whoops, 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 whoops. I wanna show you that. Er, 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 er. So if you take a look at this, like this is, um, this is a quick advertisement. So it's a little hard for you guys to see, but there's an assistance window here and I can check my answers. I get explanations of answers. I can't quite show it to you, my window's too small. If I make it a bigger window, you can't read the text. But anyway, so that, that's the, Mike Myers Total Seminars Testing Engine, written by your friend and mine, Michael Smyre, with a little help. Okay, uh, ba -da -ba -ba. Dan doesn't want his prize. Okay, this happens. Hold on, hold on. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Dan, 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 Dan. Okay, so guys, uh, the second prize is up for grabs, and it looks like, according to my list, Zach Morrill. Good old Zach, man, my, fa my favorite Brit in the whole world. Zach, you are the winner. First of all, uh, Dan, thanks for throwing it back into the pot. Always appreciate that. I know we, you've won before, so thank you for putting it back in the pot. And uh, Zach, uh, you are, uh, you're the winner, so congratulations to you, Zach. Zach, send an email to Kathy Y. K-A-T-H-Y-Y at totalsem.com. Tell her you're the winner of the second one. You don't even have to tell her Dan gave it to you. And uh, she will send you the connection. We actually use your email address as your login. So that's why we do the email, because that's the best way to do it. Somebody likes my Mondrian coffee mug. You don't like Mondrian? I like Mondrian. A lot of strong coffee. <laughs> Let's go jogging. No, 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 no. 
Nutty Archery, 317. Are the vouchers valid worldwide? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, U.S. only. There are, I hate to tell you this. Oh, what was your name? I, I see you're in Hebrew, but I forgot your name. I'm so sorry, I forgot your name. Uh, CompTIA, it's my understanding, and I don't know this. I think CompTIA is also selling discount vouchers directly. They're not as good of a deal as ours, but they are there. The CompTIA.org, and they do sell international vouchers as far as I know. So Andre's telling me all about the Gemini protocol. I don't even know what Gemini space is, but I'll look it up. Uh, chunkier fish, uh, 3.22 p.m. Is crypto worth investing in? Uh, given the dollar value it's at, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, guys, you got to remember, I was staring at Bitcoin at 25 cents for years and ignoring it. So, you know, what are you going to do? Zach passed on it as well. All right. By golly, we're going to I'm going to give this stuff away. See, you guys, this is why it's important to answer any competition. We've had two guys give it away already. So I'm going to go to the third person who said type two, which is David Zientara. David Zientara. Okay, uh, I'm not even going to... David, let me know if you want the prize. Michael Smyer, you have to let me know if David wants the prize. If he doesn't want the prize, then we'll pass it on to a fourth person, which isn't the first time we've done that. And again, guys, thank you so much for passing on that. I know you guys have won before, and uh, it's a very nice kindness to pass these on, especially the new folks who are just here today who want their stuff. So let's see what happens if... Uh, where to go? 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 If uh, David Ziantara wants his prize. Uh, if not, David, just go to Kathy Y at totalseb.com. Tell her you're the second winner today and just tell her if you want A plus, net plus, security plus, and you got it. How's that for easy? So I can't buy vouchers for my exams cheaper via Total Sem website. All right, so I'm going to tell you. Who, what is your name? I'm so embarrassed I've forgotten your name. Who's writing in Hebrew? I have heard that the state of Israel provides vouchers for people. I would go over to comptia.org, find somebody, just find somebody, send them an email and ask as a... I'm assuming you're a citizen of Israel. You, you wrote in Hebrew, so that's all I got. Uh, it, you, you should ask www.comptia.org. Find the contact us, even if you've got to get to human resources, no, not human resources, public relations, whatever it is, and ask them this question. Do citizens of the state of Israel get free vouchers or aggressively discounted vouchers? There's this other whole class where... Uh, certain schools, this is in the United States, and I know it's international now, where organizations, like here in the United States, certain states in the United States allow any of their students, high school, technical schools, whatever, to get extremely discounted exams, like 85% discount. It's a very, it's, I, I can't remember what the name of the program is. It's hard to get in because you usually have to be a full-time student. You have to be taking a course with an instructor. You know, you have to be at a, uh, what do they call it? It starts with an A. I hate words sometimes. Accredited, uh, an accredited course, but you should check those out. They, they have a lot of deals like that. Oh, you're living in Tokyo? Uh, okay, so... Even if you're living in Tokyo, if you're an Israeli citizen, you still might get the discount. It's, it's a matter of where your, your citizenship is, what school you're affiliated with, if any. It never hurts to check. Chunkier fish. Military will pay for you to get Security Plus. Well, uh, here in the United States, the military won't pay for it unless you're in the United States Army. Uh, the United States Army has an amazing program that uh, not only will pay, you have to be active military, it not only will pay for your exams, it will pay for your training materials. It's a very impressive product. 
Uh, we work closely with the United States Army on that. So I wouldn't be surprised if offers like that are common all over the world. So unfortunately, chunkier fish, when you just say military, I'm not quite sure what kind of military are we talking about. All right. Man, I got to tell you, that was uh, Michael Smyer literally writing out all the questions. I don't, I'm not even looking in the chat window. I'm going to look in the chat window real quick because I want to see Carla Rain is there. Who else is here? I don't know. Farouk Didar is back. I haven't seen that for a while. September Dandelions. Sep Dandelions. Hi, hi. Lola. Thank you, Lola. I apologize. She went to a bar and she asked me to dance when she came to me. She did just like cherry co. I'm sure you're tired of that song. L O L L O L. Oh, Tola would even did it. Academy Partners, Elaine, thank you so much. So yeah, so uh, CompTIA has a deal with what are called CompTIA Academy. And uh, I don't even know how to research that. Go to www.comptia.org and just ask. Elaine says they get 50% off. Is that it? That surprises me, Elaine. I always thought it was like 85% off. Tola, where's Dave Rush when you need him? Tola, I got your song. I was there. I was there. I was there. Chunkier fish. My cousin went to the Air Force with some sort of tech-related MOS. They paid for him to get multiple certs. Nice. I didn't know that. Chunkier fish, thank you for the information. I'm actually hoping to get my A-plus and enlist. Well, if the military is going to pay for it, enlist and then let them pay for it. Uh, whatever. Oh, David, Dave Rush's power is out as well. Yeah, so guys of many chance, we suddenly go and this live stream ends. That's because I've run out of power. Eh, we've only got 30 minutes left. We should be okay. Zach Morrill, don't you Americans pay your electric bills? Ha ha! No, no, no. We just let the Brits pay for them. Uh, there's September Dan Lyon saying hi back. Good, good, good. <laughs> Tolowit. I would figure out that one of Dave's sentient pie. So Dave Rush on Fridays does raspberry pie. Now, hang on a minute. I know a lot of you guys are like, who wants to learn about raspberry pie? I'm here to get, I want to pass some certifications, CompTIA certifications. Well, what Dave Rush does, and he has a good job of it, he doesn't do this with every episode, but most episodes, what Dave Rush is doing with raspberry pies isn't, I mean, it's nice to have a raspberry pie, but like, you ever wanted to set up a DNS server? Why not do it on a Raspberry Pi? You do it with a $50 piece of equipment. Uh, we've done pie holes, uh, which is a known question on the uh, Security Plus, which is a DNS sinkhole, and that's what a Raspberry Pi hole is. So Dave does a lot of very practical uh, classes with the Raspberry Pi, but it's not so much a Raspberry Pi as more of a very cheap computer to learn about a lot of CompTIA certification stuff. Uh, so it's, uh, Dave does a great job. He's on every Friday right here at the Total Seminars channel. Speaking of, do remember, guys, that everything is 20% off. We got 25% off on all eBooks. Let me get that information up there so I'm not lying to you. So that is A plus, Dead plus, Security plus, Passport eBooks. So they just you know come right to your phone. Uh, that's 20% off, and all you got to do is uh, go over to www.totalsem.com. Go over to our merchant area, pick up some of these passport ebooks, and uh, just before you check out, use the code 021521. And Michael Smyre will put that up on the screen for us as well. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. It's always very helpful for the channel. The other thing I'd like to uh, bring up is that uh, there is a Discord channel. Now, this is not an official Discord channel. I do not run this Discord channel. Uh, my buddy Jose Braden runs, runs it, although he's getting a lot of help from a lot of the folks who are on here now. Uh, and uh, it is a great resource. Uh, I'm, I'm only on Mondays and Wednesdays. And it's really hard to ask me technical questions like sending me email that I 
can just address on a single basis because I get 400 emails a day and I, I can't do it, I'd like to. However, with this Discord channel, and Michael Smyre, can you put up the link for the Discord channel, please? Uh, our Discord channel, not ours, it's not mine, I'm not affiliated with it, Total Seminars is not affiliated with it, so if somebody says something naughty in there, you can't sue me, all right? I got no control over this thing. Uh, but it's a great place. We've got a place in there, you just drop in questions, it's a Thursday, and you know I'm not gonna see anything till Monday, you want somebody to answer a question? There's lots of good texts in there, we're more than glad to help you out. Please check out this Discord channel, it's extremely helpful. Oh, by the way, we tend to have little get-togethers uh, after uh, the live stream. So I'll be on that, I will be on the Discord channel today uh, about 10 minutes after we finish. We're at whatever time we finish today. So do please check it out. Also, if you've got a camera and a mic and, and all that, we also get onto the voice channels. So don't be afraid to show me your pretty face and uh, do, do join in. It's a great resource, especially when I'm not right here to answer your questions. Please give that consideration. Okay. Danny O'Neill from Dublin, Ireland. Hey, Danny, you want to hear an Irish joke? What's green and sits outside all year round? Ready? It's called patio furniture. <laughs> That's a great joke. That's a knee slapper right there. Patio furniture. Farouk typed in the code. Thank you, Farouk. And John Batman did too. Thank you so much. Phoenix333 is from Warsaw. Wow. Good to see some East, Eastern European, barely Eastern, but Eastern Europeans in there. Always good. Welcome aboard. Uh, September Dandelions, when do you have a Network Plus study group? I don't. Uh, all I have in terms of public exposure are these AMAs, that's it. Uh, so this is a study group in my opinion. Uh, sept September Dandelions, you could type in questions in here. Also, did you notice that I'll have an answer, but other people have answers in here too. We got some great texts in here. Elaine Batzer alone has uh, got a, an amazing program uh, up in Massachusetts and as an instructor, very, very knowledgeable person. So you got a lot of good people in here is all I'm trying to tell you. Uh, also do keep in mind, I'm pushing the Discord channel as a place for you guys to study, okay? I mean, the secret to a good study group is just get enough people in there. And the secret to get enough people in there is telling people to get in there. And uh, the Discord channel is growing quite nicely and I, I can't re recommend it enough. Uh, I'm assuming Michael Smyre has put uh, the link for the Discord channel. Oh, I see it. There it is. So please do check that out. Uh, chunkier fish. My fish is my face is spooky. Look at this. <laughs> you ain't got nothing. Da, 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 da. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Tolo it. Chunkier fish. You can do it audio only. We don't have to see you if you're nervous about that. Uh, and I'll. Ganatra, Ganatra, hello from London. I, 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 uh, I've, been, uh, I've been to London, or at least southern, uh, southern England. Never been to Wales, never been to Ireland, never been to Scotland. Uh, but I get to London quite a bit. I remember I was meeting a friend, and he's like, oh, Mike, I'll drive. I was in this nice hotel in Kensington, it was nice. And he's like, I'll drive and pick you up and we'll go tour a castle or whatever it was. And I remember, here's his car sitting on the side of the road. And I walk up to the car waiting for him to open the door. And, he, and he's looking at me, he goes, why are you standing next to the driver's door? <laughs> it's like, oh, that's right, England, left side. Okay, so I had to jump right up. It was pretty funny. You had to be there. We have one more competition coming. Just looking for questions. Yeah, uh, so I see both Tolowit and Andre volunteering to help out. You know, really, guys, you organize these things any way you want on the Discord channel. 
But uh, as long as somebody has a place where they can ask questions and answer when I'm not around, I mean, that's 90% of the battle there. All right, guys, keep it, keep it clean, keep it clean. All right, I'll tell you what, looks like questions are slowing down, but before we, uh, I'm not, I don't want to shut down yet because I want to do at least one more competition. Uh, all right, guys, if you do have questions, it's time for you to start asking them now because we're only 19 minutes before we end anyway. Mm -mm. If you're ever back, pop me a message and I'll hook you up with some local places to drink that are fantastic. I tell you, the funniest drinking story I have in my life was in London. And so I'm giving some talks in London for CompTIA. And uh, this is their EMEA group. And uh, there was a group of Irishmen and a group of Scotsmen. Now this is what I've been told, okay? I'm just a dumb American here. And that the Irish and the Scots don't like each other until you put them in front of a bunch of Englishmen. And then I call them the Celts. And uh, so I'm sitting here in this not very good airport bar, drinking, a, having a pint of warm British beer. It's good. And uh, bitters. And I'm drinking this beer, and all of a sudden the Celts come along. It's about eight of these folks. And they're looking at me, and they're like, oh, Mike, let's go drinking. And I go, uh, guys, I'm drinking right here. And they're like, oh, oh, no, that's not drinking. Come on, follow us. So we walk out of the bar. I remember we walked past at a McDonald's, a McDonald's that just looked like an American McDonald's. I thought that was very strange. Yeah, I know McDonald's is in Europe, but uh, it was still weird, okay? And it's, it's like 1030 at night. We walk past a McDonald's, and we go to this. This is a nasty-looking place. Cinder blocks painted white, couple of windows, Flat roof, not much signage. But I'm walking in with the Celts, right? And uh, they turned me on to a beverage that I'd never had before. So you take a pint of beer, okay? And then you take a shot of whiskey. So it's either going to, if the Irishmen are talking, then it's Irish whiskey. If the Scots are talking, then it's a glass of scotch, okay? So you've got a pint and you got a shot. Now, in the United States, we have something called a boiler maker, where you take a shot and you drop it into the beer, kaboom. No, these guys are much more sophisticated than this, and the whiskey's way too good to waste it in a beer. So you would pour yourself a glass of whatever. I thought I knew whiskey. These guys knew 100 times more than me. And uh, so you, you drink your whiskey, and then you drink the beer. You don't slam the beer down, but you drink it pretty quick. Look, guys, I'm a good drinker, all right? I'm actually an excellent drinker. These guys buried me. They, I, I had to be scooped off the floor using shovels and a mop. And all I remember is I remember going home and I saw the McDonald's and I'm watching the sunrise. Not a good sign, okay? Because uh, I have to give a speech. <laughs> Did I mention that? Yeah, I had to give a speech. And uh, so... I remember I walked up to the counter where the, the check-in was, and I start talking to this guy about getting to my room. And the guy walks out from behind the counter and grabs me and carries me into my... I'm just talking to him what I thought was normally, and I'm speaking to him normally, blah, blah, blah. I wake up three hours later. I don't know what had me wake up. I am sweating whiskey out of my pores. And I was just like, what time is it? Where's my speech? And I made that speech with maybe 10 minutes ahead of time. I had a hangover that would kill a horse. No, I didn't even have a hangover. I was still drunk. And uh, I gave a great speech. Everybody, was, everybody loved my speech. The lesson to the story is, in general, Avoid trying to keep up drinking with any European because y'all been at it a lot longer than we have. As Americans, we've been at it maybe 300 years. You guys have been at it since Caesar invaded the Egyptians and took their beer. Oh, Scott came on? 
Hey, Scott. Good to see you, man. All right. So, uh, everybody's talking. Hi, Scott. Nobody's even listened to my hilarious story. Okay. All right. It looks like we're wrapping up on questions. So let's go ahead and do one more competition. Okay, guys. Uh, let's do one more competition. And then we'll call it a day. And I'm going to have to do some research on Starlink and Gemini Internet Protocols. That's going to be fun. I'll enjoy that. You guys ready for your last question? Alex, Michael, did you ever provide Scott with power in order to not join us on Discord? You know, you may even like us. <laughs> okay. Okay, here we go, guys. This is our last, uh, this is the last thing we're going to do today. Let's have one more question. Remember, these are A-plus questions. This is an interesting question I have here. The reason I'm bringing this particular question up, guys, is because CompTIA tends to hold on to older technologies. So, I want to put up a question that is indicative, oh shoot. Ah, I answered the question and now I can't unanswer it. Ah. I got to do a different one. I clicked on the answer and now I can't, I can't, I can switch to a different answer. Ah, I messed up. Ooh, ooh, this is a good question too. Let's make sure I can get the answer right. Okay, you guys ready? Here we go. This is the last one. Okay, here we go. Last question of the day. In a laser printer, you have a single vertical line Along, it's along one edge of the paper. What should you do? Clean the corona wire, calibrate the color output, check for leaking toner, or replace the fuser. Here we go, guys. Remember, do not write down A, B, C, or D. Dave L, write out the, you got to do the whole thing there, bud. Carla Rain typed in replace the fuser. Is that, oh, that is an answer. Sorry, Carla. I was going to tease you. And they, no, you know. Okay. All right, we got a number of answers here. Do we have. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and let's, let's do this one. Do, 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 do. I'm pretty sure when I'm looking at this laser printer, you have a vertical line along one edge. All right, so that gives us some clues here. Number one, it's not going to be the fuser. The reason it's not going to be a fuser is because the fuser would leave smudging all over the place. If the fuser isn't working, there's nothing to fuse the toner to the actual pages. So it's not D. Uh, clean the corona wire. Coronas don't usually get that dirty in and of themselves, but if the corona wire were to get particularly dirty, that would mean that the corona wire is not providing a good uh, negative 600 voltage across the photosensitive drum. Uh, so that would make an even uh, dark color or a dusty color across it. Uh, calibrate the color output. That just sounds like a bogus answer to me. I'm pretty sure that the right answer is C. Check for a leaking toner cartridge or spilled toner inside the printer. And using the cool interface designed by my buddy Michael Smyre. Check your answer. Your current answer of C is correct. And I've got all the explanations. I can't scroll down to show it to you because my window's too small. You wouldn't be able to see it. But I have all the other answer explanations in there at all. So the right answer is check for leaking toner cartridge or spilled toner inside the printer. The only other thing that I would have said that would have made it, well, no, I was about to lie. No, if you've got a, a single line like that, that pretty much means you've got a toner leak. 
Okay, so the, the answer C is correct. Let's see who said, check the leaky toner cartridge. And you guys got to remember, the order I see them is the, uh, the right order. But a lot of you guys said re clean the Corona wire. That's interesting. Okay, so I say the winner is Mr. Meeseeks. Mr. Meeseeks, congratulations to you. First of all, Mr. Meeseeks, now you've won before. Do you still want to keep your prize? Da -da 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 -da. So Mr. Meeseeks, you are the winner. But Mr. Meeseeks, I know you've won before. I'm gonna ask you, do you still wanna keep the prize? You are more than welcome to keep it. All right, I'm gonna gamble Mr. Meeseeks wants to keep it. Mr. Meeseeks, I'm Mr. Meeseeks, look at me. Oh, he's passing it on, of course. All right, hang on, replace the toner. Andre's the winner. Andre, you're gonna you're gonna pass it. I know you are. I'm not gonna bother. Farouk Didar, check for leaking toner. Farouk, I say you're the winner. Now hang on. Andre did beat you, so let's give Andre a chance to either pass or play. Andre, call the ball, buddy. Otherwise, it's Farouk's. Didar, Farouk, guy, I've been. Mispronouncing your name. Okay, that's right. Farooq Didar, you are the winner. Congratulations to you, Farooq. I wish you could like tell me how to pronounce your name. I'm just, the guy, I hate. Farooq, join the Discord channel. Tell me how to pronounce your name properly. So anyway, Farooq, congratulations to you. You have won the third prize today. In order to claim your prize, all you need to do is go to, send an email to Kathy Y, K-A-T-H-Y-Y -Y, -Y, at totalsend.com. Uh, Scott Jernigan's typed that right in there for you. And congratulations to you. And you are the third and final winner for today. So we've given away three sets of practice questions. Look at us go and go. All right. Well, guys, I think that is it for today. First, uh, thank you so much. On Wednesday, we're going to have a conversation about boot order. And that means both within the bias level and within the operating system. So I'm basically gonna get you from a cold system all the way to a fully running operating system. I'm gonna concentrate on Windows because everybody's mostly interested in that because I'm better at that than I am, say, Linux in terms of boot order. Uh, but uh, they all basically work the same. And we might have a little nice talk about UEFI, that kind of a thing, that'll be fun too. Getting some incoming messages, we're okay. All right, we're looking good, all right, well guys, uh, that is it for today. I will be on the Discord channel in about 10 minutes from now. Uh, thank you so much for showing up. Remember to like and subscribe. Uh, the, those really, really help more than you can possibly imagine. Uh, keep in mind, remember our discounts uh, that we have for today. We've announced those twice, Scott. We got those. And uh, I will see you guys on Wednesday, and we will talk about boot order as well as anything else you want to talk about. Yeah, I want to stress one more thing, then I'll let you go. If we have a topic for that day, that topic's never gonna take two hours. So there's plenty of time for general questions. So never worry about that. If Mike has a title, topic, fine. You can still ask broad, broad questions. And uh, I am, well, broad questions that portray to pre preferably CompTIA certifications. So that's all I got for you kids. So with that, I am going to let you guys go. I will see you guys on Wednesday. Have a great time, and until then, this is your little Uncle Mikey saying good night. Good night.